Um, welcome everybody for our uh, department seminar of this week. And uh, again, we are uh, streaming online and um, we are very happy to, um, to have today uh, Dr. Thomas Browning from Geomar in Germany. So <clears throat> a little bit uh, about uh, Thomas. Um, Thomas is interested in investigating the controls on the abundance, ecology, and physiology in the modern ocean of ocean phytoplankton. To, the, to do this, uh, his team uses a multiple, multidisciplinary combination of fieldwork, most, uh, mostly open ocean research cruises, phytoplankton culturing experiments, diverse analytical techniques, numerical analysis, and simple modeling. This is supplemented by combination of satellite, remote sensing, and analysis of climate model output. Tom Browning uh, record, he has a master in environmental geosciences from the University of Bristol and a PhD of earth sciences from the University of Oxford. Following his PhD, he moved to Geomar in Germany for an EU Marie Curie fellowship. And he was made, then made a senior scientist. He has recently been awarded by an ERC starting grant. So congratulations for you. Uh, today is going to talk about climate regulation of oceanic nutrient limitations. So um, thank you again, and the podium is yours. Great, thanks very much. Um, so hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for the, uh, the introduction and the invitation to speak at this uh, seminar series. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't been, I haven't had the chance to visit either Israel or Haifa, but, but despite this, I do feel like I have some sort of uh, connection. And this is because I've just got back from a, uh, a five week uh, expedition on uh, the RV Meteor, the German uh, research vessel uh, on a cruise through the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is part of a collaborative uh, um, program between Guillemar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Northern Germany, where I'm based, and uh, both the University of Haifa and IOLR, the uh, Israel Ocean and Limnological uh, Research Center. So, um, so although many parts of this planned expedition uh, were changed, you know, as a result of the war, thankfully ten researchers from uh, from Israel were able to come and be part of the uh, expedition which is great. And some of them you might recognize here on this, uh, this team photo. So, you know, on, on this expedition, we, we collected thousands of samples, uh, you know, ranging from seawater to sediments, to aerosols, um, to plankton. And uh, we brought these back and, and this will be the start, where I think of the start of a, a collaborative journey in terms of analyzing the samples and working on these data together. But these are our science talks uh, of the future. So to the topic of today's presentation, so this uh, is an image that many of you will have seen before. It's the global distribution of uh, chlorophyll, which is a pigment found in all phytoplankton, uh, as detected by a satellite sensor in space. So colder temperatures, uh, colder uh, colors, but so the, 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 the bluer colors, that's where um, there are lower concentrations, uh, warmer, greeny, redder colors are where there's elevated concentrations. And we can see there's very large spatial variability. Um, and there's also large variability through time, both on seasonal and intraannual uh, timescales. So, so why do we care about the phytoplankton? So many of you are aware of this already, but in case not, so they're the basis of all marine life. They are the plants of the ocean conducting photosynthesis, producing organic matter. They are responsible for around 50% of uh, prime production on earth and they play an important role in regulating uh, the partitioning of carbon between the atmosphere and the ocean we also as well some of us at least could care about them purely on an intellectual level uh, they're a major feature of the earth that we live on and we want to understand what makes them uh, operate so what regulates uh, phytoplankton in the ocean well they certainly need uh, light to grow, um, so that restricts them to the upper few hundred meters uh, of the water column. They also need nutrients, and actually over most of the ocean surface, um, supplying some nutrient or combination of nutrients can stimulate phytoplankton growth. 
And so that's what this figure uh, shows here. Each dot represents a location where an experiment at C has been conducted uh, to assess uh, the limiting nutrient. And the color of the dot indicates the nutrient that was found to increase the biomass of the phytoplankton. And uh, in the figure here, you can see a lot of blue points and a lot of red points. And uh, blue points indicate nitrogen was found to stimulate a biomass increase. And red dots indicate iron was found to stimulate a biomass increase. And this is the broad scale pattern that we see uh, 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 for phytoplankton nutrient limitation in the ocean. So in uh, in deep uh, in regions where deep waters uh, upwell to the surface, and so we're talking about the Southern Ocean, the Equatorial Pacific, the North Pacific, also a very deep mixing of the, of the, of the high latitude North Atlantic. In these regions um, where there's upwelling, iron is the first nutrient to run out and limits phytoplankton growth, whereas in most other regions, it's nit nitrogen. And there's some definitely some, some, some regional exceptions to this trend, uh, but this is the overall um, pattern. So uh, this is what these experiments kind of look like in practice. So we go out on research cruises like the one we just got back from on the mid uh, in the Mediterranean. And in our research, we typically collect uh, the seawater using a towed device that we tow alongside the ship uh, and pump uh, water up for a few meters depth into a laboratory on the ship. So really critical with this water collection is that we get the seawater onto the ship uh, without um, uh, contaminating it by trace metals. Um, so in a so-called trace metal clean manner. Um, so the metals that we're, we're talking about here are, are ones like iron, zinc, and manganese. So the water is pumped onto the ship through plastic tubing using a plastic pump, and they've all been cleaned with acids to remove metals stuck to the plastic surfaces. And then when we collect the seawater, we do this in an environment where uh, this is um, free uh, from dust particles. There's a, there's a filter uh, in place to remove dust particles that's pumped in uh, to that laboratory. So we fill the water into clear polycarbonate bottles, and then we spike uh, the seawater with different nutrient combinations. Then we put the bottles into an on-deck incubator, which keeps temperature and light levels relatively uh, close to that of the sea surface. And then finally, after we uh, after a few days, we take down the experiment, filter out the phytoplankton, and um, uh, see how they've responded. Where phytoplankton grow in response to a, a, a nutrient addition, this indicates the nutrient uh, is limiting. So this is an example of how the results of bulk chlorophyll uh, can look uh, in these types of experiments. So this was a study from a few years ago now uh, in the Southeast Atlantic. So where we sailed up the West African coast out into the South Atlantic uh, and then down again. So this is one example experiment here. Uh, bars show the mean chlorophyll responses of triplicate replicates, nutrient treatments. Um, and in this experiment, we had a control uh, with no nutrients added. Uh, then we were adding nitrogen, iron, and cobalt in all possible combinations. Uh, and what we found here is that in order to get phytoplankton to grow, we had to add both nitrogen and iron simultaneously. So this is one of the an experiment where we see co-limitation by both nitrogen and iron um, at the same time. Um, we also found that adding uh, this side, that adding cobalt or cobalt containing vitamin B12 actually stimulated biomass increase further beyond that of the nitrogen and iron treatment alone. And uh, so uh, we describe this as serial limitation. So in this case, the addition of nitrogen and iron has stimulated phytoplankton growth to the extent that cobalt has been drawn down uh, to limiting levels. Um, so we also had experiments where iron was the main limiting nutrient, nitrogen was the serial limiting nutrient, so they grow in response to iron, but more in response to nitrogen and iron in combination. Then we had other experiments that were nitrogen, iron, serially limited, so responding to nitrogen, and then more to nitrogen and iron in combination. Then we had other experiments um, where uh, nitrogen um, was the only limiting nutrient adding iron, or cobalt uh, didn't lead to any additional uh, response. So these types of experiments, they've been instrumental kind of in framing our understanding of which nutrients limit phytoplankton growth in the ocean. They do have several issues, and I'm not going to go into them all here, but one key aspect is that uh, 
These types of experiments conducted on research cruises, they lead to an incomplete and static picture of nutrient limitation in the ocean. So just this relatively small collection of experiments has taken uh, decades to produce. So there's no way to see how nutrient limitation has changed over seasons, over years, or over decades. Uh, and there's no way to monitor uh, how nutrient limitation is changing uh, in response to climate change um, in the future. So how do we uh, move forward? Well, one potential phenomenon to exploit is the fluorescent signals that phytoplankton emit. So when uh, chlorophyll molecules in phytoplankton absorb energy from photons, and this green blob here is uh, uh, chlorophyll in some generic phytoplankton, um, they re-emit some of this energy as red light, and it's called fluorescence. So this property has been exploited for decades uh, in biological oceanography, where a bright and typically blue light flash is shone onto a seawater sample, and the resulting chlorophyll fluorescence uh, is detected. And so for a given intensity of light flash, uh, the, the amount of fluorescence recorded is proportional to the chlorophyll concentration in seawater. More fluorescence means more chlorophyll. However, the relationship um, uh, is not perfect, so that fluorescence intensity normalized to the actual concentration of chlorophyll uh, uh, measured by uh, other methods shows some variability, and this variability is due to phytoplankton physiology. And actually, we find that the prevalent nutrient limitation regime has a large uh, influence on this. So if we go back to that study of nutrient addition bottle experiments in the South Atlantic that we were looking at before, on the, uh, on the x-axis then is the experiment number, on the y-axis is this active fluorescence per unit chlorophyll. And the dot color indicates the nutrient that was found to be limiting uh, to phytoplankton. So the red dot at the top here indicates that iron limitation was found, the blue dots indicate nitrogen limitation was found, and these red and blue dots indicate co-limitation was found. And this trend of iron having higher fluorescence per unit chlorophyll in comparison to nitrogen uh, limited waters is what actually we consistently observe throughout uh, much of the ocean surface. And the direct reg iron regulation of this signal is indicated by how these signals change in response to iron emission. So these arrows here indicate how the fluorescence per chlorophyll has changed when we've added iron. And you can see there's a large drop in the iron treatment over two days. Contrast the nitrogen limited sites. So basically, no, they have low values already and they show no changes when you add iron. So where does this extra uh, fluorescence come from? Well, the general consensus is that there are two sources. So firstly, photosynthesis requires a set of machinery that's found in the thylakoid membrane. And uh, I mean, we could go into a lot of detail here, but uh, it's not, the key point is that uh, this machinery requires iron and different parts of these machinery require different amounts of iron. So two key parts are photosystem two, or PS2, and photosystem 1, or PS1. And both of these photosystems contain chlorophyll molecules, um, but PS1 requires about four times as much uh, iron as PS2. Uh, so in laboratory cultures of phytoplankton that are grown under iron limitation, it's been found that they have um, phytoplankton produce much more PS2 than they do PS1 as a result of this lower iron requirement. So what's this got to do with fluorescence? Well, the chlorophyll in PS2 uh, emits fluorescence, whereas in PS1 it doesn't. So an increase in the PS2 to PS1 ratio under iron limitation increases fluorescence per unit chlorophyll. Secondly, uh, under conditions where iron is limiting, but there's enough nitrogen, phytoplankton produce light harvesting pigments that are not already partially energetically connected to a reaction center. So in phytoplankton, the pigments absorb uh, sunlight energy and then pass that energy onto a reaction center where this light energy, energy is processed um, and converted into chemical energy. And that's the process of photosynthesis. So when the light harvesting pigments are not coupled to a reaction center, they fluoresce more of the energy uh, that they absorb. So exactly why they produce these energetically disconnected Lightning senses is a bit of a mystery still, 
Uh, we know that reaction centers contain iron, so it makes sense why under iron limitation they produce less of them. But why do they produce the extra uh, pigments? Well, it could be that the, the pigments are kind of ready and waiting there, uh, uh, ready to couple to a reaction center when iron sporadically becomes available. Could be, could be that uh, an option. So either way, so driven by these two mechanisms, we'd expect uh, uh, high fluorescence per unit chlorophyll in a region where iron is limiting and low fluorescence per unit chlorophyll in a region uh, where um, nitrogen is limiting or both nutrients, nitrogen and iron are sufficient. So we can make active fluorescence measurements where we shine a bright light flash onto a seawater sample and detect the resultant fluorescence. Um, we can make these almost instantaneously. We can measure chlorophyll concentrations by other methods, and we can compute fluorescence per unit chlorophyll. Uh, and this provides a potential method to observe iron versus nitrogen limitation uh, at a much higher resolution than, for instance, uh, individual uh, bioassay uh, experiments at sea. So for example, these are some continuous uh, underway observations from the Tara expedition, so pan-ocean expedition. Uh, and where you have higher fluorescence per unit chlorophyll, uh, so it's principally in this upwelling area here of the equatorial Pacific, this indicates uh, eye limitation. So this is neat, but it hasn't really got us far enough. This is still a measurement from a ship or some sort of in-situ platform. It's still a snapshot in space and time. So the only way to get global time-resolved observations of the ocean surface uh, is from satellite remote sensing. And there could be a way uh, with fluorescence. So sunlight absorbed by phytoplankton stimulates uh, fluorescence emission in a similar way to that of a bright blue light flash. Uh, so. It's observable as a distinct peak in the red portion uh, of the spectrum at around uh, 680 nanometers. And so the NASA MODIS sensor, the longest running ocean color satellite sensor, uh, has detection uh, um, uh, bands at an appropriate wavelength to observe this. Um, and the way this is typically reported is as a uh, fluorescence line height. So it's the height of the, the peak and the central band um, uh, with a baseline uh, derived from the radiance of two adjacent bands subtracted from it. And so this is often referred to as passive chlorophyll fluorescence because it's stimulated by natural sunlight and not by an, a bright artificial blue light flash. And uh, this difference is, is part of the, uh, the reason for why uh, these uh, satellite signals of chlorophyll fluorescence haven't been utilized uh, as much as they could have been. Uh, so trying to understand the passive satellite observations purely with active fluorescence measurements made on ground level, um, you know, I think it's hindered our progress a bit in, the, in this area. So the active fluorescence signals are stimulated by a bright, very intense, very short duration light flash, typically a uh, single wavelength of blue light, um, whereas sunlight stimulated fluorescence uh, has a much weaker, it's stimulated by, by sunlight with a much weaker intensity where phytoplankton are exposed uh, for an extended period and by uh, a full solar spectrum. So we should fully expect that the resultant fluorescence emission uh, from these uh, uh, should, be, should be different. So this stimulated uh, a proof of concept study uh, in the tropical Pacific in 2019. So we went on a research cruise uh, on the RV Zona across the equatorial Pacific. Um, so across uh, uh, the upwelling tongue here where um, nitrate concentrations are elevated and we expect iron limitation through to regions to the north where nitrate concentrations are much lower and we expect nitrogen limitation. So these are the measured uh, nitrogen and iron concentrations. So as expected, nitrate concentrations are very high values in the core of the upwelling zone. These flow to uh, lower values uh, further to the north. Um, and uh, iron concentrations, they stay relatively low throughout the entire um, transect. So we also conducted these nutrient addition experiments to show that in high nitrate waters, uh, 
uh, phyto plankton only grew where we supplied iron. So this is indicated by red here. These are the, the iron added treatments. Chlorophyll grows when we add iron in both of these. And then to the north, where nitrate concentrations were lower, phytoplankton only grow where we add nitrogen. So the nitrogen uh, uh, treatments are indicated by uh, by blue here. So in the nitrogen limited sites, we saw this type of serial response where phytoplankton grow more in response to nitrogen than iron over nitrogen alone. Um, and that indicates that uh, a serial limitation by iron, probably due to the low iron concentrations in the system, but the primary limiting nutrient um, was nitrogen. So in this study, uh, you know, we had a collaboration uh, with Max Sato at uh, Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute. We also correct, uh, conducted um, uh, metaproteomic measurements for Prochlorococcus, which is a dominant phytoplankton type uh, in this system. And this showed uh, an array of so-called nutrient stress proteins that showed trends in st nutrient stress that matched uh, the nutrient limitation that we'd identified by the nutrient limitation experiments. Um, so these proteins are a urea transporter, two nitrogen regulatory proteins, P2, NTCA, and this amino transferase. These showed very low or below detection values in the high nitrate iron limited waters that increased um, significantly uh, in the um, lower nitrogen waters to the north. Um, conversely, an iron stress protein, flavodoxin, this, so this showed elevated levels throughout the entire transect, um, suggesting that iron was at quite low levels um, throughout. So in addition to these uh, nutrient stress proteins uh, in Prochlorococcus, we also looked at the photosystem proteins. Uh, so from experiments with phytoplankton cultures grown under iron limitation, we know that PS2 uh, uh, two to PS1 ratios can increase under iron limitation against due to the fourfold higher iron requirements of PS1 uh, over PS2. And for the first time, uh, we can actually look at this uh, in field populations. Uh, so we found that proteins associated with PS2, so this is all these proteins here, um, and remembering that PS2 uh, doesn't contain as much iron, so we found these all to stay at relatively elevated values throughout the entire transect, whether iron limited or nitrogen limited. In contrast, the proteins associated with PS1, so these ones here, these showed values below detection in the iron limited waters and much more abundant values uh, in the nitrogen uh, limited uh, region. So uh, a major shift uh, across uh, this nutrient limitation transition, um, uh, resulting in a shift in PS1 to PS2 ratios. So we also made active fluorescence measurements. So fluorescence stimulated by a bright blue uh, light flash and then normalized chlorophyll concentrations. And these showed the expected uh, trends with, so, so on this uh, uh, figure here, so this bar chart here is the iron limited sites and this bar here with minus iron, these are um, sites where um, without iron addition, and you can see it's got high fluorescence per unit chlorophyll. And when we add iron at those sites, it results in a drop, uh, around a threefold drop in fluorescence per unit chlorophyll. Contrast this bar chart here is for the nitrogen limited sites. And uh, initially, there's low fluorescence per unit chlorophyll, and when we add iron, um, the fluorescence per chlorophyll stays pretty much the same. So uh, to sum up, uh, really concrete evidence for a shift in nutrient limitation from iron limitation to nitrogen limitation, which is also reflected in active fluorescent signals. So in order to see if this transition extended to passive sunlight stimulated uh, measurements of chlorophyll fluorescence, we also measured um, uh, the upwelling radiance coming from the surface of the ocean using hyperspectral radiometers um, yeah, fitted to the bow uh, of the ship. So these, yeah, these continuously record the upwelled uh, radiance coming from the surface ocean uh, throughout the visible spectrum. And with these, we can calculate a, uh, a sunlight stimulated fluorescence line height, pretty much just like in the way uh, a satellite sensor from space does. And we can also independently term, determine a chlorophyll concentration uh, of the waters from uh, these signals using the same 
uh, way that the satellite sensors determine chlorophyll concentrations. And um, and then we can see how fluorescence per unit chlorophyll changes. And so this is what we observe. So the x-axis is the downwelling solar radiance going from uh, nighttime values zero here uh, through to bright values uh, uh, later in uh, midday. Um, the y-axis is the uh, chlorophyll normalized passive fluorescence stimulated by natural sunlight. The blue dots are the nitrogen limited sites and the red dots are the um, iron limited sites. So a couple of things to note from this. So firstly, the observations show an increase in fluorescence, uh, fluorescence line height uh, at lower light levels, so down here. And that is expected because there's more and more light available for phytoplankton to absorb and stimulate fluorescence in the first place. Then it reaches this sort of plateau here um, at around some sort of level below 500 micromoles of photons per meter squared per second. So why does it plateau here? Um, well, this is due to a suite of mechanisms that phytoplankton employ to progressively reduce the amount of light and absorbed light energy that's getting to reaction centers because it could result in overstimulation and, and damage to the reaction centers. We call these mechanisms non-photochemical quenching. Um, in the process, this reduces the amount of fluorescence that they emit uh, in the process because it restricts the amount of energy that's getting to the, to the, to the pigments that are fluorescing. So these two aspects, firstly, that it shows a plateau at all, and secondly, that this plateau is reached at some level below 500 micromoles photons per meter squared per second, is really useful for satellite remote sensing. And this is because all satellite observations of uh, fluorescence are at radiances below 500. And this is because below this light level, signals are too weak for the satellite to observe. And secondly, because of these plateaus, it means that no irradiance correction seems to need to be applied at irradiances above 500. The result is then that the, the, the fluorescence plateau then is an indicator uh, uh, of either iron limitation at high values or nitrogen value, nitrogen limitation at lower values. So extending to the satellite observations then, so this is the the regional pattern in chlorophyll normalized fluorescence. Uh, this is from multiple years of data composited together to get a really clear and smooth picture. So broadly speaking, elevated values are seen uh, in the equatorial uh, welling region here, and these generally decrease uh, going into the north. So a couple of aspects. So there's quite a lot of white space here. So uh, we set a chlorophyll range over which we felt um, confident in operating. And this is the chlorophyll range that we observed on the research crews. So these white regions to the north and to the south, so these are much lower chlorophyll concentrations are actually thought to be below the detection limit uh, of, of, the, of the sensor we are using for, for, for sunlight stimulated fluorescence. Uh, and so we're using MODIS, the MODIS sensor here. And these white regions next to the coast, these have much higher chlorophyll concentrations. We excluded them uh, because uh, our higher chlorophyll concentrations, the linearity uh, between chlorophyll concentration and absorbed light energy in phytoplankton uh, breaks down. And uh, so some of you might have noticed um, this distinct region of lower values right here uh, in the center of the upwelling. And this core RI2, uh, this suggests that uh, iron stress in this region uh, is lower. And looking into the literature, this is not the, the, the first time this has been found. So this study making active fluorescence measurements and they were sailing from within this core of the center of upwelling outwards uh, and, then, and then back into the core, they found uh, a, a transition in iron limitation that went from lower iron limitation through to high iron limitation right in the core. Um, so this is using uh, an alternative iron stress diagnostic, but um, with a level of iron stress increasing at lower values. So the upwelling rate is uh, uh, highest right on the equator on a, rel a relatively narrow band. And actually the, um, 
Previous observations of the dissolved iron profiles in the region have shown that iron concentrations increase rapidly uh, below the surface layer. So this basically points towards, in the core of that welling zone, there's more upwelling uh, of iron to the surface, uh, reducing iron stress of phytoplankton uh, and generating the signals that are observed in the satellite fluorescence observations, which is a lower va lower value of normalized fluorescence. Um, uh, um, in this core of upwelling region here. So, well, for this region at least, we then have a tool uh, to assess to see how iron stress has changed in over time in this region. Um, so, there's two decades of satellite fluorescence observations available from MODIS, and actually, this is a region with major interannual uh, inter variability. Uh, in outwelling as a result of El Nino suffered oscillation. So this is ENSO. So during El Nino, outwelling is strongly reduced and sea surface temperatures were warm. During La Nina, outwelling is enhanced and sea surface temperatures uh, are lower. So starting off by looking at simply the chlorophyll A concentrations, the proxy for phytoplankton biomass, this plot shows how sea surface temperature and chlorophyll anomalies so their value minus an average value for the entire record changes over two decades. So black is the sea surface temperature and green uh, is chlorophyll. And the chlorophyll scale here has been reversed. So it's got negative values um, uh, at the top so that the two uh, uh, move in the same direction. And you can see there's a pretty reasonable, reasonably close match between the two. Uh, when surface waters are colder, there's more phytoplankton, and this can be explained by more nutrient supply to the surface. In contrast, warmer waters, there's uh, less phytoplankton, which can be attributed to lower nutrient supply. So now we can add in our, our proxy for iron stress, our new uh, field validator proxy, which is fluorescent normalized to chlorophyll. And we can see an even closer association. Um, so warmer surface waters, are associated with less iron specifically being brought to the surface, in turn, increasing iron stress and reducing the amount of phytoplankton present. In contrast, colder surface waters uh, um, um, are associated with more iron being brought to the surface, reducing iron stress, uh, and in turn, increasing the amount of phytoplankton present. So with this field validated uh, uh, iron stress proxy, um, we can see the mechanistic underpinning uh, um, of the major phytoplankton biomass changes that are occurring uh, on interannual timescales um, in this region. So looking forward, uh, we feel pretty confident uh, about using this satellite proxy for iron limitation uh, in this rather limited region of the tropical Pacific. Now, how about the rest of the world's oceans? Well, we're not there the, yet. We can't rule out uh, the importance of other controls on passive fluorescence emission uh, in other regions where there's major variability at a global scale and phytoplankton community composition in the light climate they're living under and um, uh, seawater temperatures, for instance. So in a new project, uh, we aim to, to get a better handle on this, uh, both with observations in the field, like I've described uh, here, but also using controlled experiments uh, in the laboratory uh, where we grow, we'll grow phytoplankton in, uh, in a kind of mesocosmic uh, approach and observe their natural fluorescence characteristics uh, to really get a better handle on this and where we can pick apart uh, the potential controls on passive fluorescence emission under different environmental conditions for different phytoplankton types. So this is a project that's recently started at Guillermo. So, uh, so my main take home messages then, so, uh, so we found that passive chlorophyll fluorescence is a robust indicator of nutrient limitation in the equatorial Pacific. It demonstrates cycles in iron limitation, and these tend to correlate with the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the major driver of upwelling variability in this region. And potentially this is a pathway towards global time-resolved observations of phytoplankton nutrient limitation. And potentially we can use these for evaluating climate change impacts on this key ecosystem property. We could also use it for validating uh, the nutrient limitation predicted by uh, biogeochemical ocean models. 
But in order to get this global picture, to extend out the equatorial Pacific, we really need to address the critical unknowns of these other regions. Uh, and so with that, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll close there. Thank you very much, Tom. So um, I'm open the, the, for questions from the audience here or from the audience virtually. I don't see all the faces virtually, but um, free, feel free to just pop in. No questions? Awesome. Yeah, please, go ahead. Thank you for, for a very interesting uh, topic uh, and lecture. I, I wonder whether you're expecting other phases in what kind of other controls you expect to affect um, the uh, plankton or the proactive uh, uh, measurements uh, apart from, from the upwelling that is not to be controlled. Um, it was a little difficult to hear the question there, but I, if I understood it correctly, it's uh, what could the potential other controls of uh, passive fluorescence be in, in other regions? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, so, well, there could be several controls. So different phytoplankton have uh, different types of pigments. They have different pigment organization in the thylakoid membrane that could have a potential impact, just a change in, in phytoplankton species composition could have a potential impact on the absolute magnitude of uh, passive fluorescence per unit chlorophyll. The light regime that phytoplankton uh, live under could have uh, uh, an impact. So if I look here, so phytoplankton uh, growing under lower light uh, are expected to, um, uh, to have to, to have different um, mechanisms to cope with bright light when they're exposed to the to the surface. So let, let's put that in another way. So in some regions of the ocean, there is uh, deep mixing of phytoplankton. So the phytoplankton experiencing a very variable uh, um, light uh, climate, and their average light that they're growing under is probably quite low, but periodically they're reaching the surface where the satellite could be making a measurement and that irradiance is pretty high. Uh, and so how the phytoplankton respond in terms of chlorophyll fluorescence when they're living under these different uh, uh, light regimes is something we don't really know. It could be a major control uh, on both uh, how the fluorescence per unit chlorophyll changes at low levels and also could influence uh, the absolute levels of fluorescence per chlorophyll uh, um, at these plateaus. Um, temperature could play a potential role. We can't rule it out. Uh, we don't have good data on that. Um, and so what we really need to do, what we're trying to do with these experiments is kind of systematically step through these different controls and kind of and rule out um, the potential other drivers of fluorescence per unit chlorophyll and ultimately trying to pin it down to just being the nutrient limitation. Uh, that would be the ideal. Thank you. So I understand the polar regions are probably very uninteresting for you uh, when you're dealing with the uh, uh, light limitation. Yeah. Yeah, so for sure. So we're really interested, particularly with the Southern Oceans, so one of the largest eye limited regions, yeah. uh, but very different light light regime to the Equatorial Pacific. So um, the postdoc working on this project has, has just got back from a cruise uh, in the Southern Ocean investigating this, and so they're still looking at the data. Um, but uh, ultimately, yeah, we want to see how uh, it could be impacted by the different environmental controls in these other regions where, you know, Things really look a lot different than the Equatorial Pacific. Thank you. So I think we have two questions from the audience virtually. Um, Mike Rom. But you are muted. You are muted. Okay, right. Um, you are assuming that chlorophyll equals growth, or at least your definition of limitation is the increase in chlorophyll. But you know that chlorophyll changes 
in set per cell is not constant. In fact, a lot of what you've shown is that. Um, and it appears that if you give them a lot of um, nitrogen, they're going to use the chlorophyll as nitrogen storage. Does that change some of the conclusions of this work? Thanks. Yeah. So it's a good question. So, um, so here, so this is the I've, I've skipped back to this the bioassay experiment results here, and so yeah, yeah, these are these are showing chlorophyll changes, um, uh, and we're using this as a diagnostic of what the nutrient limitation uh, regime is. So in response to iron addition, in response to nitrogen addition, nitrogen and iron, and so part of this chlorophyll change for sure, just like you've said, is due to an increase in pigmentation per cell. So not, not necessarily an increase in bulk phytoplankton biomass, but just an increase uh, in phytoplankton pigment. Um, however, in this case, we also did uh, flow cytometry measurements, so uh, measurements of cell numbers. And these show basically the same trends. And for the, some of the key phytoplankton that are there, like Sinecococcus, Prochorococcus, these show the same trends in cell numbers. Although what we can also see from those as well, that was we see an increase in fluorescence per unit chlorophyll telling us that a large portion of this chlorophyll change response that we see is due to change in pigment per cell. Uh, so in this region, at least, it seems, is, in terms of these experiments, it seems to be a combination of both. It's an increase in biomass, an increase in, uh, in chlorophyll per cell uh, in response to supply of the limiting nutrient, whether it's nitrogen or iron. Is, does that make sense? Okay. Um, another question from the audience, uh, I think Barak. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for the very nice talk. Uh, you are using or applying a methodology that is uh, concentrated on the surface water. How much do you think it represents the photic zone in terms of the limitation? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, so, uh, with these chlorophyll uh, fluorescence measurements that are observed from the satellite or observed from the passive radiometers that we have in the front of the ship, they're basically observing the upper couple of meters maximum of the of the water column. This is particularly strong for chlorophyll fluorescence because um, it is red light, which is absorbed strongly by seawater. Um, so. Yeah, by and large, we think so. So, so we're at best observing the nutrient limitation of the of the upper few meters of the water column, and we assume that reflects the nutrient limitation in the mixed layer, which you know typically varies from twenty meters of the surface layer down to a few hundred meters. So, if there was a large deep chlorophyll maximum at a hundred meters or so below the water column, the nutrient limitation there might be different. Yeah, and we wouldn't see that with this approach. Um, if I had to give sort of caveat uh, why I think it's still really important to get the very surface nutrient limitation is that typically the primary production tends to be highest there because that's where the most light is. Even if the biomass, like the biomass might be a, bit, a little bit lower um, or sometimes much lower, the, the, the photosynthetic rates are typically higher in the surface because of the higher light availability. Uh, and we have another question from the audience, Ilana. Great uh, talk and really interesting. Um, following up on Barak's question, um, so one of the issues is also getting um, the you know the the satellite or remote sensing data from areas that are under clouds most of the time. So how do we solve this this problem? Uh, the, yeah, so it's a, yeah, so it's a it's a good it's a good point. I mean, uh, so this image that we're looking at now, if you can still see my screen, I mean, this is a composite over I don't know, it's two decades of data, so you get this beautifully clear picture. But on any given day, uh, it, it would there be a lot of black on here where you've got no data because of cloud coverage or because there's sun glint or because you've got gaps in between uh, the sort of the, the the swathe coverage of the satellite and uh really with 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 chlorophyll fluorescence i mean we can't really get around that uh 
Um, there's there, there's not um, uh, a way to kind of see through the clouds, as it were. Um, the, the way in practice we'll, we'll deal with it is that by compositing a few days together, uh, usually we get pretty good coverage. So if we look at a uh, an eight day composite uh, of global ocean chlorophyll or global ocean uh, fluorescence, we have pretty good uh, surface ocean coverage. So we would take, if we could see nutrient limitation at eight day resolution through time over the last two decades and into the future, we'd take that as uh, still being um, a pretty good result. <laughs> Could you use some of the these um, passive fluorescent sensors and gliders at, uh, to get you know like DCM to get the signals from DCM or any other depths other than the surface air, surface layers that you're getting? Uh, yeah, so that's a good manner? point. That's a good point. So uh, so these so you could use active fluorescence for this. So any sort of platform where you have a um, a uh, uh, enough power supply to, to 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 run an active fluorometer where you're shining these bright blue light flashes and you're detecting the fluorescence, and in a, and in uh, a way you can independently determine chlorophyll. For instance, you could use um, just uh, absorption line height. Uh, you could get fluorescence per unit chlorophyll, and you could use that as a proxy for for, for iron versus nitrogen limitation. So, for instance, one could envisage that in the future. Uh, these types of sensors are on floats that are, you know, populating a large portion of the ocean, doing profiles daily or weekly, and getting depth profiles of of fluorescence per chlorophyll throughout the entire water column, including the deep chlorophyll maximum. Um, the coverage will never be as good as the as the, uh, the satellite observations, but nevertheless, you know, it would still be uh, um, a good approach, and probably the only approach. Thank you. Okay, I think that we have another last question from Michael, Mike Rom, I think. Uh, hi, Tom. It's actually from Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for the talk. It's always great to, to hear you. Um, so following up on Ilana's question about cloud coverage, this is a pretty, not, not such a sophisticated sensor, right? So maybe citizen science and you can mount these on boat and and have a better coverage is that something so uh so for sure you could put the the passive radiometers on pretty much pretty much anything uh, you could put them on a, on a mooring or you could put them on ships of opportunity uh that could be like running throughout the global ocean and then you get a, you get away with you uh you um uh overcome the cloud problem you'd overcome the problem with coverage uh, of the satellite sensor due to sort of gaps in its coverage swath as it goes around the earth. Uh, your coverage, say on a weekly basis, would still be pretty low in comparison to, to the satellite image. Um, it's something that could definitely be used, but um, uh, ultimately to get this full global coverage, particularly in regions where there's few, few ocean cruises or few um sort of ship crossings that could be used opportunity opportunistically like in the southern ocean vast areas of the south pacific and so on uh, you really need to use the satellite okay. okay if there is no any more questions and actually we got into 2 p.m so local time so thank you everybody and thank you again tom for the wonderful talk um and I will keep you in the loop for any further um, talks that we have in the seminar, if you agree. Sounds great. Thanks okay. very much. Okay, great. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, and looking forward for next week. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks very much.